Hello friends! Today I want to talk to you guys about something a little bit unusual. I haven't done a series on sex drive in at least male sex drive yet. I do plan to do one, but not very soon. However, I have learned something about this subject in the last six months that I've, I'm very proud of actually, to be honest with you. It's something new. Nobody has, to my knowledge, nobody has ever done this before. Not in academic papers. It's never been done in humans before, to my knowledge. It's something very new and very powerful, and I'm very proud that I, uh, you know, came up with it, basically. So, I'll tell you guys a little bit about how I came up with it. But before I do, let me tell you the reason why I had to come up with this. Basically, there are some people, it was mainly because of clients. So, I have some clients who have really, ba really difficult sex drives. And I haven't... Usually, this happens from people who are taking SSRIs or people who are taking finasteride, or some people who are depressed, or have some other kind of situations that cause them to have a lower sex drive. So, although I haven't studied and I don't fully understand how sex drive occurs in the male brain, I'm telling you very openly, I really do not understand how it works, I don't know much about it. But I did learn some things along the way, and I have a hack that, for example, it's not gonna take somebody uh, who, for example, doesn't have a sex drive and give them a sex drive all year, but it's a hack that one can use. For example, if you have a low sex drive and you're a man, uh, say in the morning one day you have, a, you have a date at night and you wanna have a higher sex drive at night, this video can get you there. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you guys how that works. Before I do that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I learned about this myself. First of all, I've been living in Los Angeles for six years or so. And I spent a lot of years living in downtown LA. Downtown LA has a, um, a place called Skid Row and Skid Row has a lot of methamphetamine addicts. And because I was living in downtown LA and I'm a friendly person, sometimes I chat with these people on the street and I learn different things about them. And one thing I noticed about these uh, methamphetamine addicts was that they were hypersexual. And I didn't know why. They were hypersexualized. I also noticed that, uh, I also, because I have some friends in, in Los Angeles who are gay, and I noticed in the gay community, Methamphetamine and a drug called GHB are very popular. They're sort of sex drugs. And I never really understood why, of course, again, having not tried them myself. So I didn't really know what, what was going on here, but I kept that in mind. The second thing I noticed was this. Big Lenny, who is someone I'm very fond of from the Del Rey Misfits, he has been, <laughs> in the last two or three years, he's been having this like crazy sex drive, which is very, you know, it's about a very particular subject. But it seems to happen to him much more, I mean, he gets this urge, this strong urge, much more severely, which he calls the subspace. That's what he calls it. When he takes a drug called Phenobut. Phenobut is a GABA B receptor agonist. So that was quite interesting to me as well. And again, I was thinking Phenobut makes people like this. GHP does. Methamphetamine does. What's going on here? Until finally, I found a paper one day when I was studying uh, my finasteride, I think it was my finasteride series for my blog in which I found a paper that showed that methamphetamine, cocaine, because by the way, this happens to people on cocaine also. I've met some older people on cocaine in LA who have a similar situation. So cocaine, methamphetamine, GHB, all of these drugs, I found a citation showing that they increase acutely the synthesis in the brain of a, of a steroid called allopregnanolone. This was very interesting. Allopregnanolone, it seems, um, I'll explain more about allopregnanol, but allopregnanol, it seems, increases sex drive acutely. Now, there may be another effect going on with these drugs, right? Dopamine, they all cause dopamine transmission, especially cocaine and methamphetamine. Drugs that cause do dopamine transmission or inhibit the reuptake of dopamine cause more dopamine signaling at the, at the dopamine receptors. This reduces prolactin, okay? Prolactin is a hormone that makes men much less sexually driven. So dopamine signaling does that. I mean, that, that's why people, for example, bodybuilders take, um, when their prolactin goes high, they take uh, cabergoline or pramipexol. Cab you should never take cabergoline because it causes a fibrosis in the heart but at higher doses, but, but pramipexol is a better version. But those are both agonists of the dopamine receptors. So, by, so these drugs, if they release a lot of dopamine, it'll lower your prolactin, but they also cause a release of allopregnanolone, which directly turns people on, or turns men on at least. So this was really interesting to me. Now, let me tell you a little bit about allopregnanolone. In the brain, there is a receptor called the TSPO receptor. The TSPO receptor used to be called the peripheral benzodiazepine receptor. 
meaning the peripheral Xanax receptor or benzo receptor, because it, it was thought to respond to that and it was thought mainly to be some kind of similar to the GABA-A receptors, but it turned out not to be. The TSPO receptor is the rate limiting step for the synthesis of neurosteroids in the brain. So in the brain, steroids are synthesized, including progesterone, by the way, but steroids are also converted, like from progesterone through a 5-alpha reductase enzyme, which is blocked by finasteride, into allopregnanolone. So the brain synthesizes allopregnanolone either by converting it from progesterone or synthesizing it de novo or synthesizing progesterone de novo. Anyway, at the end, the, at the end of the day, agonizing the TSPO receptor uh, uh, removes this rate limiting step on the synthesis of neurosteroids. So I'm not completely sure how do these drugs increase allopregnolone? Nobody knows entirely. They could be agonizing the TSPO receptor. I'm not entirely sure. So here is, uh, sorry, I have some notes here, so I'm just looking through them. Oh, another thing I should mention is progesterone. Along the way, during the same time period, I came across a paper, I'll try to include it here somewhere, that showed that uh, men who have higher progesterone levels had more likelihood of sexual activity. Interestingly, in this case, it was homosexual activity, but I think it also showed more sexual interest for women, though I'm not completely sure, but definitely for men. Also, another thing that's known about progesterone is that progesterone improves male erections. And so, so, there's, so here's the whole thing. There's the allopregnanolone, the progesterone improves erectile quality, progesterone increases sex drive, homosexual sex drive, uh, which is, it's not just homosexual, I think, but that paper was homosexual. Allopregnanol increases sex drive. Dopamine may lower prolactin. So putting all these things together, I came up with a system uh, of, of, a few, of a few tools used together that can dramatically increase sex drive, okay? So here's what they are. First of all, progesterone. Now, a normal male who is not on, uh, for example, hormones or anything like that, if you're on TRT, by exa for example, you won't be uh, producing much progesterone. Men produce progesterone, but those men who are on TRT don't produce much anymore because most of the progesterone is, is, is actually produced in the gonads. So if your gonads are not working, you're producing far less progesterone. If you are one of those people on TRT and you want to replace your progesterone, one thing you could do is use HCG. Another thing you could do is take oral micronized progesterone, okay? Oral micronized progesterone is actual progesterone. There's a difference between that and uh, progestins. Progestins are, for example, what women take for birth control in the US. Whereas in France, they don't take progestins. Progestins are very associated with cancer. They're not uh, real progesterone, but they agonize the progesterone receptor. Whereas, for example, in France, the women for birth control will still take oral micronized progesterone. What's the problem with the oral progesterone? It's not very bioavailable. The micronized version is more bioavailable, but to be honest, it's bioavailable enough, okay? So you can definitely take that. You can find oral micronized progesterone online. I'm sure you can find it at different places. If you can't find that, you can find definitely on Amazon in the US a progesterone cream, which then you can't measure exactly what you're taking, but it's still gonna work, okay? So if, if, you, if you wanted to replace your progesterone as a man from oral micronized progesterone, I did the calculations. Um, I wish I could include a set. I have basically a long paper where I worked on it. I don't know if I'll include it on a blog post. If I do, it may be in the description below. But the point is, eight milligrams of oral micronized progesterone taken twice a day will replace the normal man's progesterone uh, levels. If you take more than that, now you have super physiologic levels of progesterone. On, on its own, just having more progesterone levels will already in improve your erectile quality and all these kind of things, I think due to progesterone. But because progesterone is upstream to allopregnanolone, it's converted by 5-alpha reductase into allopregnanolone eventually. So because of that, if you consume more or if you have more progesterone in your body, you also have more allopregnanolone automatically. So for example, there's a rodent study in which rodents were given finasteride, but then they were given progesterone, and the progesterone attenuated the reduction of allopregnanolone synthesis due to finasteride, for example. So the first thing is progesterone. So what would you do? If you were going out to, uh, you know, later on in the day at night, and you wanted to have a great time, you wanted to have a, a good uh, sex drive, you would take your progesterone in the morning, maybe you would try the first time you ever do it, maybe you would try 10, then maybe you try 20. I, uh, I have, so I, I have one client who's using over 100 milligrams, uh, although he finds it a bit calming. So not consistently, huh? this is just acutely. So you can use, you can experiment with different levels, but ideally do it a couple of times with hours separated in between before the nighttime. So then what happens at, at the nighttime? So, or actually I should mention before anything else, two things that I've found to be important. If estrogen is too high, the sex drive will be lower. So one of the things, 
one of the things that a person should do is keep their estrogen somewhat in the middle of the range, in the middle of the US range, uh, just for, for the sake of sex drive. If you don't have issues with your sex drive, don't worry about this. But if you do, keeping it in the middle of the range would be good. Another thing I should mention about progesterone, progesterone actually also lowers prolactin. The higher your progesterone signaling is, the lower your prolactin also goes down. Uh, it's an interesting uh, thing that I found out recently. So the progesterone, the AI may be needed. Etifoxine, that's E-T-I-F-O-X-I-N-E. Etifoxine is a very interesting ep anti-epileptic and anxiolytic drug from, I think it's only used as an anxiolytic drug in Europe. But basically what etifoxine does is uh, modulates the GABA A receptors, similar to Valium and Xanax and Clonopin and all of those, although it seems to have less bad withdrawals, but I'm not completely sure. So that's why I warn you, if you do take any foxing, don't take it every day. You can only, if you, if you do take it with a prescription from your doctor and so on, beware of the fact that you may get adapted to it. The GABA A receptors, when they're modulated, they really, basically, they, I think they either downregulate or they fight the modulation in some way. So when you take the drug off, the person gets tremors, starts shaking because it doesn't have as much GABA signaling. So be a little bit careful. If you use it once a week or something like that, it may not be a big deal. Why would I mention etifoxine? Etifoxine is interesting because, and by the way, etifoxine is like almost a perfect antidote to finasteride syndrome. Why? First of all, finasteride syndrome, what does it do? Well, as you guys will see if you go to my, my blog or read about it, basically when people take finasteride, they, they don't have as much 5-alpha reductase. So less progesterone is converted to allopregnanolone. They also lose out on two other neurosteroids that are important. You can go to my blog to learn about them, but allopregnanolone is the most important one. So what happens when you take etifoxine? All allopregnanolone itself doesn't just cause sex drive, increased sex drive. It also does almost exactly what Xanax does, but at a diff different point on the GABA-A receptor. It modulates it. It opens up the GABA-A receptor to make it more responsive to GABA. So if someone is taking finasteride, they have less allopregnanolone, they also have less GABA-A signaling. So when you take etifoxine, it undoes that by itself, but etifoxine also agonizes the TSPO receptor or peripheral benzodiazepine receptor, the rate limiting step in the synthesis of neurosteroids. So taking etifoxine directly solves the problem with the GABA-A receptor, opening it up, and then causes more transmission of allopregnanolone, even though you have less 5-alpha reductase to convert it. So etifoxine will cause more allopregnanolone to be created. If you take progesterone and then you take etifoxine, you have now in two places, because you have more pro uh, progesterone already, so automatically more allopregnanolone, and then you, you, you uh, opened up the rate limiting step, so it can be converted even further. The final thing I mentioned, and by the way, you don't need etifoxine for this. If you just combine the progesterone with the next thing that I'm about to talk about, it'll work. But that could be for a more, um, you know, if you really, if you really need a lot of tools. The next part is this. So, basically, these are the drugs that I think are most effective. Phenobot does this. Phenobot causes allopregnanolone synthesis, causes increased stress, sex drive. It's not as pronounced as some of the, the other drugs I'm about to mention, and it's also much longer acting. Because Phenobot is much longer acting, I am personally much more uh, careful about it and I'm more concerned about it. Even though agonizing the GABA-A receptors is not nearly as dangerous as agonizing the GABA, sorry, sorry, agonizing the GABA-B receptors with Phenobot is far less dangerous than agonizing GABA-A receptors. GHB is, I think, the most effective uh, chemical for this purpose because it's short acting. So if somebody takes GHB, gamma hydroxybutyrate, uh, if, you, if you take it, an hour or so later, you'll get this increased allopregnanolone uh, acutely synthesis. You'll feel it, you'll get a little bit of a sex drive, especially if you've taken the progesterone beforehand. So GHB is great. Of course, GHB is not easy to, for people to procure, but there are legal compounds that people can procure that are converted by the liver into GHB. There's one called GBL. GBL is converted by alcohol dehydrogenase, I think, in the liver into um, into GHB, and there's one called 1,4-butanediol, which is converted by aldehyde dehydrogenase into GHB. 1,4-butanediol uh, is my favorite one. Uh, I don't think it's great to use except for this purpose, but for this purpose, it's extremely effective. If you take progesterone earlier in the day, depending on how much you take, and you take 1,4-butanediol an hour beforehand, you manage your estrogen, and if you added a defoxin on top of it, you will create the most strong acute sex drive that you can create given how your you know, mental health and everything else and your hormones are, are doing at the time. So it's a very effective tool. The second person who ever tried this was Big Lenny, and he told me that it was very effective as well. So 
I, you know, if you guys have issues with sex drive because of depression or because of whatever else, for example, and maybe you have a girlfriend or a wife or you have some kind of social pressure, you feel uh, it's difficult for you to perform sexually because you're not as interested in it, you may find that this will work acutely. Anyway, guys, I hope this, this works for you. Please let me know if it does. And, you know, I'm very proud of this, to be honest, because I've never heard of anyone combining these before. It's extremely effective. Uh, it's one of the proudest things I've discovered since I started making the channel. Anyway, thank you so much, guys, for listening. I'll see you next time.